Well, it's great to see you this morning. Thanks so much for being with us. Songs for the summer. Song of a saviour. Song of a shepherd. Song of a sovereign. Song for the satisfied. This morning, Psalm 23. A shepherd was out on the hillside. Better if I switch it on. Shepherd was out on the hillside, keeping his sheep, not by night. That was Christmas. Suddenly, as he's on the hillside there, a, a, a guy drew up in his posh um, uh, BMW-sized car. There he was in all his fine gear, with all his technology and all his stuff. And he leaned out the window, he said to the old boy shepherd, he said, if I can tell you exactly how many sheep there are in your flock, could I have one of your sheep? Could I have one of them? So the old boy thought this was quite good. He looked at the guy and thought he was a young up and coming upstart. And he thought, well, this sounds like good fun. Yeah, we'll do that. So this young guy got out of his car, he, he got his Dell notebook out, he took his iPhone, he, he linked up to the internet, he got the GPS satellite navigation system, fixed the exact location of the field he was in on the hillside there. Maybe he was in Scotland, Dave, I don't know. Maybe Yorkshire. And there he was, he scanned the area, he scanned the field in this ultra high definition, high resolution photograph. I mean, take the photograph, he, he unlocked his Adobe Photoshop on his, on his computer. Within seconds, he had an email there with an Excel spreadsheet. And a few minutes later, he got a response through his iPhone by the GPS satellite. And he printed off on his little handheld printer in the back of his car, a 150-page report in high-tech language. You have, he said, exactly 1,586 sheep. The old boy said, you're right, I do. I guess you can take one of the flock. He watched this young man select one of the animals from the flock there, somewhat amused as he stuffed it into the back of his posh car. The guy was just about to drive off, plowed as punch, having left, of course, his 150-page report. And the old shepherd said to the young man, hey, if I can tell you exactly what your business is, can I have my sheep back? The young man thinks for a bit and says, well, okay, fair dues. Yeah, go for it. Without a second's thought, the shepherd said, you're a business consultant. Wow. With due deference to Johnny. You're absolutely right, said the young guy. How did you guess that? There was no guessing said the old shepherd. You showed up here, even though I never asked you to come. You want to get paid for an answer that I already have to a question that I've never asked. And you don't know anything about my business. Now, can I have my dog back? Well, that story has many applications to reality of so many people who live their life thinking they know it all. And of course, friends, that's the danger, is it not, of Psalm 23. We think we know everything it's got to say to us. The temptation for the preacher, of course, is to try and think up some new novel approach, some new angle of application for the congregation. The temptation for the listener is, of course, to assume that there's little, if anything, here for me this morning that I don't already know. So why don't we just sing another song, have some tea, have a biscuit, and I'll go home. We think, you see, Psalm 23 is also very simple, don't we? But if we think that way, it may just be that we're missing its depth and its strength. We may think that this psalm sounds so idyllic, it sounds almost like a smell of escapism that really we're missing what's really at the heart, true, lasting peace. Rest. That's what this psalm is about. Indeed, that's what the gospel is about, because that's what heaven is about. If we become complacent, perhaps we're missing the key jewel of our, of our Christian faith and, and our Christian witness, and that is contentment. 
And of course, if you and I think that this psalm is only to be used on a deathbed or, or at a funeral, we may be missing out on key truths for everyday living. That's why, if you read the email in the week, you'll know that I've been working this week to think about this is a song not just about a shepherd, but it's a song for the living, not just the dying. There are some commentators, and I think they're helpful, they suggest that Psalm 23 hangs in the middle of this trilogy of shepherd psalms. The good shepherd, the, the great shepherd, the, the chief shepherd. I think there could be some, some helpfulness thinking that way. And God willing, next week, God will be helping us through Psalm 24 as we think about the song of the sovereign, the chief shepherd, and all the glory associated with him. Whether that's intentional or not, I don't know. But it seems as we read Psalm 23, we're, we're, we're tapping into the toward the end of David's life. This, this sounds to me, I perhaps does to you too, not a, a song of a young guy, but a song of an older guy, an older David. A look back as he dwells upon his life and, and he thinks about the trustworthiness of his shepherd through all the changing scenes of life. But as he looks back, it's not just a nostalgic look back, it's, it's an encouraging look back, an encouragement to ongoing obedience, an encouragement to faithful following, an, an encouragement to daily devotion, everyday devotion, a song for the living, not just a song for the dying. So basically we're going to split this song into two with a third element in terms of conclusion. First we're going to see on the hillside, verses 1 to 4. Then later we'll see the fireside. And lastly, we'll think about looking at this song from the Lord's side. Come with me to these first four verses. So well known, I'm sure. But here's the wonderful provider of daily provision, daily protection, daily direction, and daily consolation. Not just a song for dying people. Although, of course, we all are but daily living provision, protection, direction, and consolation. Here is the, the overarching view. The shepherd is absolutely adequate for every uncertainty that the sheep find themselves in. To bring to that uncertainty a genuine sense of living serenity. We've already rem been reminded that sheep are, are weak and foolish and defenseless. We've also been reminded that sheep are not just wild animals. Actually, they're owned animals. They're the property of the shepherd or the farmer who bought them. And in that sense, we are owned sheep, owned by God. We were made by him. And if we know him as our Savior and our Lord, we've been doubly owned, not just made, but bought back by him. And as we saw last week in Psalm 22, that the Lord Jesus Christ bought us back by dying for us, paying the price for our sin. The shepherd sheds his blood. He lays down his life for the sheep. And so it's true that we read in the New Testament that we, because we belong to him, we no longer are our own. We've been bought with a price. The Lord is. Present tense, it's not a, a grammar lesson. <laughs> but isn't it so important? The Lord is. And the Lord is my shepherd. Present tense condition. And a great source of confidence for us. And so we can say whatever our position, whatever our location, whatever our lot, it is well with my soul. Such is the pastoral care of the Lord, our Lord, the great shepherd of the sheep. Here is Jehovah Jireh, the provider. Look in verse 1 and verse 5. Here is Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, verse 2. Here is Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord my righteousness, verse 3. Here is Jehovah Imeku, the Lord who is with you, verse 4. Here is Jehovah Shammah, one of my favourite phrases. The Lord 
who is there. Isn't that amazing? The Lord who is there. Wherever you are, he's there. He is there. It's not that he was there or he might be there or he will be there. He is there. Indeed, here we have Jehovah Rohi, the Lord, my shepherd. The shepherd who provides, verse 1, I lack no good thing. I lack nothing that truly matters when he is mine and I am his. In Christ I have all, all that I need. I have no wants by definition if I have all in him. I may not have what I wished for, but I do have all I need. Remember how verse Psalm 22 finished last week? He has done it. It's finished. All that I need. It's all been secured. It's all found in him. Everything I need, all that's required for life and for godliness and, and entrance into heaven has been, past tense, accomplished by the Lord who is present tense with me. He's freely and generously and graciously provided for you and me if we trust in this great and good shepherd. Not only do I not want, says the psalmist, I, I shall not want. The difficulties, the disappointments that come in life, old age that catches up with us, even death will not diminish this provision. In Christ I have all things, and we read the New Testament, and in him therefore I abound. Not because I've got experience or not because I've got particular skills or wisdom or money or status or not even because I've got great faith. I abound because the Lord is my shepherd. And verse 2, the Lord protects. He, he makes me lie down and he feeds me so well that I arise. He makes me stop and think before I act. He helps me to take in God's word and, and God's promises in order that I can live out and give out God's word. And by the still waters, those waters of rest, he, he cleanses, he refreshes, he reinvigorates us. He opens our eyes and our hearts to the truth of his word. The truth that sets us free and, and protects us from error. And then the Lord directs us. Not just in the place of rest, but in the paths of righteousness. So we can bring glory and, and reflect the glory of his great name. We walk as our Father walks. Righteously. That's the great call. We live in the, in the shadow of his great pastoral love and, and grace towards us. As the shepherd directs us, those who are sorrowful are revived. Those who are weak are strengthened. Those who are sinful are cleansed and healed and forgiven and sanctified. You want to see the care of the Father on show? Look at the shepherd. Notice, of course, that you've heard this many times, I'm sure. Here's the shepherd and he leads from the front. He doesn't drive from behind. Here is careful guidance. He's walked the way before us. What a comfort that is. And then in verse 4 again, we have the great consolation of the great shepherd. You see, it's not due to a lack of provision or protection or, or direction that the sheep are called to go through the valleys of deep darkness on their journeys. Even as they're called to go through the dark valley of the shadow of death, that's not due to a lack of ability on the part of the shepherd. No, that is part and parcel of the sheep's existence. And as they walk, we're told they walk, they walk through the valley. And as they walk through, we're told they have this wonderful consolation of the ever-present, all-powerful I Am. Walking by their side. I'm sure you've heard this before, but it's always struck me. That it's as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Not as I run. 
don't need to run. On my walk to the Cub Scouts meeting in Batley many years ago, I had to walk past an alleyway. In the alleyway was one little house that had one little yappy, bitey, nippy little terrier dog. Now you know what my view of dogs is. I'm scared stiff. And on my way to, and on my way back, I ran past that alleyway every Friday night. Even now when I walk down past mum and dad's house, down to the little shop, I have a little glance up the alley, the dog's long dead. <laughs> but I'm still a bit... You see, when I'm faced with the dark valley, I run. Don't you? With my shepherd. I can walk. Because this great consolation. The consolation that I've been told very clearly that this is a shadow of death. It's not the reality. The reality of death, of course, has been defeated. We saw that in Psalm 22. We know it from the rest of our Bible. We know as the Apostle Paul cries, Oh, death, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? We sing regularly, Death is dead. Love has won. Christ has conquered. There's the consolation. This is a shadow. And of course, it is worth remembering, isn't it, that for there to be a shadow, there has to be some light. And here is the consolation, the consoling light of heaven. The light of life. The light of the world who stepped down into our darkness and walks alongside us. Here, of course, the, the imagery has changed. The, the shepherd is not ahead of us, leading us. The shepherd is right by our side. The shadow is cast because light is right there with us. And that's the basis of, of there being no fear of evil. As real as that evil is. Our fear, our worry, it only makes it ten times worse, doesn't it? Evil, the devil himself, he's a conquered foe. The great I am is with you, says David. And for sure it may be true that every other guide may desert you. Everybody else may, may leave you to travel alone, but not the Lord, not my shepherd. With him by our side we have everything that we could crave. Even here in the dark valley we have no other wants, just him. Nothing and no one on earth can supply what he has already secured. It is Finished, Psalm 22 reminded us. No wonder then that the hymn writer could say, Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen and help thee and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of woe shall not thee overflow, for I will be with thee. Thy troubles to bless. I can even sanctify to you your deepest distress. Even down to old age, all my people shall prove my sovereign, eternal, unchangeable love. And when the grey hairs shall their temples adorn, like lambs, they shall still in his bosom be born. That soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not. I cannot desert to its foes that soul, though all hell should endeavour to shake. I will not. I will not. No, never forsake. Because the Lord is my shepherd. The shepherd, of course, is well armed for lurking dangers. He's got a rod or a cudgel to defend, a staff to guide and control and, and round up the flock. Here's our consoling companion, ready to provide and protect and direct, truly the greatest and best shepherd in life as in death. 
A young guy went off to university to study music. It wasn't me, but it's a different story. And he lived in a, 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 a block of residences there in the university campus. And down on the, on the bottom floor lived an old, now retired, music professor. They'd been kind to him at the university over in America, this is, and they'd allowed him to stay living in the residency block. Each morning, this young man used to go down off to his lectures, and as he walked past, he always used to put his head into the old boy's uh, uh, flat there, and he said to the professor, what's the news today, prof? The professor would get his little tuning fork. Pretend that's this one. You know the little metal things? He'd tap it on the desk, and he'd say to the young guy, the news today, that's Middle Sea. It was Middle Sea yesterday, and it would be Middle Sea tomorrow. Your colleague on the third floor, trained to be a singer, he sings flat all the time. That piano down the corridor needs a retune. But that is middle C. Unchanged, unchanging, ungoverned, uncaused. What's the news? You need a middle C. And David said, you've got one. His name is Yahweh, the Lord, my shepherd. That's good news for the living, not just the dying out on the hillside of life. But it's also good news for us by the fireside. The last few verses remind us as we move from the hillside to the fireside. Here's a place of victory and intimacy, a place of security and a place of eternity. Here the picture's not so much of sheep and shepherds as it is of children in their father's house, you see. And although there are enemies, just like there are dark valleys, just like David had enemies, just like the Lord Jesus, his greater son, had enemies, we can sit at this table in comfort both in spite of and even in the face of our enemies. Because God's victory in our place, on our behalf, secures and ensures our security. Here is bravery, a calm bravery. Here is boldness, a calm boldness to sit and enjoy a refreshing and strengthening meal at the table that's been prepared for us. And do you notice this is no rushing in to grab a bite to eat and then crack on. This is not McDonald's. This is not drive through This is sit down. Intimate, long, enjoyable, victory feast. And this is not a feast for a soldier or a servant. This is a feast for a son. A son or a daughter who, verse 6, dwells, lives, abides in this family intimacy forever. This is not some domestic servant. This is the daughter of the living God enjoying fireside warmth, fireside comfort, security, and all that for eternity. Indeed, these children are, are anointed as kings and priests, heirs and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is an abundant anointing, a a lavish thing, do you see? An abundance of provision, an abundance of passion, as goodness and mercy and love are poured and poured and poured out so it runs over. No wonder David said earlier in Psalm 4 and verse 7, You, O Lord, put more joy in my heart than they, that is the world, the joy of the world when they have grain and wine in abundance. And of course, this intimacy and this this victory is secure by very definition. Look at verse 6. Surely. In fact, you could translate that only. (laughs) Only goodness and mercy. Only steadfast love are required to turn the threat of verse 4 into the triumph of verse 5. Here are these two infinite resources. They stand, as it were, like two guardian angels to secure us, even in the worst of situations. Here it strikes me that what David says in the psalm, Paul says as he writes to the church at Rome, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him graciously give us all things I shall not want? This provision overflows. How does Paul conclude? I'm convinced therefore that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons neither present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation can separate me, us, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here is goodness to supply all our needs. Here is mercy to blot out all my sin. And with God these things follow us, it says. They, they pursue us like the shepherd pursuing silly Sally. Pursued with a, with a vigorous passion to find and save and bring Home. A love, says the hymn writer, that will not let me go. No wonder I rest my weary soul on him. And this goodness and mercy is forever goodness and mercy. Do you notice? Eternal security, eternal intimacy, eternal victory. That means we can live at home here on earth, provided for, protected, directed, consoled. Why? Because we are assured of living at home in the mansion that Jesus is preparing for us. And that is forever. On the hillside or by the fireside, a song for the living, not just the dying. But one last thing. What about if we look at this psalm from the Lord's side? And I think as you look at it from the Lord's side, you can only sum it up one way. Grace. 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 Just look at the words of the song and, and let them sink in, perhaps like never before. He makes. He leads. He restores. He is with me. He defends. He comforts. He prepares a table. He anoints. He follows or pursues with goodness and mercy. He invites and ensures that his precious sheep, his precious blood-bought children, will reach home safe and secure and will dwell in his presence for all eternity. He has done it. Psalm 22, verse 31. The grace that saves is the grace that keeps. It is the grace that has brought you safe thus far. And it's the grace that will lead you home. Because he has done it. This is a song of grace to be sung by the living, not just the dying. I'm told, I'm not a great film watcher, but I'm told that Psalm 23 is recited in the 1973 film, The Wicker Man. And in the 1983 film, The Elephant Man. And in the 1997 film, Titanic. And in the 2011 film, The War Horse. This is the, the go-to psalm for film writers when they're trying to sum up distress or death. Why is that? Because it seems that in those times, the world itself is craving some sort of intervention from a God who they've largely ignored but whose grace still resonates with their deepest longings and needs. They know they need God. But they're honest enough to know that they don't really deserve God. And that's just it, isn't it? Grace is precisely that. Undeserved, unearned, unmerited favour and love from God who pays the greatest price to secure the greatest rescue. The greatest grace and the, the deepest mercy is all found in Jesus and only in him. The one who leads me in life through death and into eternity to sing of grace for the living, not just the dying. That's what he's about. Because the end product is what? Rest. Because that is is heaven. You may have read the devotional on Psalm 23 by Max Lucado, Travelling Light. If you've not, I recommend it to you. It's very helpful, very readable. This is how he concludes. Let me read to you if I may. His conclusion is that this psalm is about rest. Rest from the burden of a small God. Why? Because I have found the Lord. Rest from doing things my way. Why? Because the Lord is my shepherd. Rest from endless wants. Why? 
because I shall not want. Rest from weariness. Why? Because he makes me to lie down. Rest from worry. Why? Because he leads me. Rest from hopelessness. Why? Because he restores my soul. Rest from guilt. Why? Because he leads me in the paths of righteousness. Rest from arrogance. Why? Because of his name's sake. Rest from the valley of death. Why? Because he walks me through it. Rest from the shadow of grief. Why? Because he guides me. Rest from fear. Why? Because his presence comforts me. Rest from loneliness. Why? Because he is with me. Rest from shame. Why? Because he has prepared a place for me in the presence of my enemies. Rest from my disappointments. Why? Because he anoints me. Rest from envy. Why? Because my cup overflows. Rest from doubt. Why? Because he follows me. Rest from homesickness. Why? Because I will dwell in the house of my Lord, who is my shepherd forever. As we close and sing a song of the amazing love, the strength of God's love, the width of God's love, the power of God's love to be with us even in the darkness of the grave. Can I ask you a simple question? Are the first five words of this song your words? The Lord is my shepherd. Not a Lord, the. Not a buddy who'll sit alongside me and just be like a genie from a bottle. No, the Lord. Not was or will be or I'll turn to him when I've got a moment. No, is. My, not my church, not my religion, not my habit. Mine. And my guide, and my protector, and my provider, and my consolation, and the one who secured my victory, and the one who assures intimacy with the God of heaven, and the one who assures security, and he's the shepherd forever. Is he that? Are the first five words your words? If not, make them your five words right now. O oh Lord, be my shepherd. The prayer of faith to a repentant, wandering, self-directing sheep making a mess come home to the fold he paid in full on the nail so that you can say the Lord is my shepherd that being true the words of this last song to a tune that you'll know well, take on wonderful, consoling, rest-filled meaning.